and the new school superintendent next on Black Nouveau. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockers. And I'm Faith Collis. We're glad you could join us. On this edition, we'll hear the old school stylings of Harvey Scales and the Seven Sounds. We'll talk with new MPS superintendent, Dr. Gregory Thornton, and have an update on America's Black Holocaust Museum. But first, for the first time in a few years, there were a number of major summer festivals celebrating the African-American experience. We begin with Juneteenth. Milwaukeeans of all ages turned out to enjoy the Juneteenth Day celebration. Oh, big nose. He got an edge. He too big to sit on edge. There was food, fun, and entertainment. One thing I want just to say is that um, the very first Juneteenth, 39 years ago, I was at that Juneteenth. And I've been at most of them all of these uh, 39 years. I was working at one of the uh, community-based organizations when we had the first Juneteenth here on, um, it was Third Street at that time. So it's just very important as far as you know, the celebration, of course, of, of the freedom uh, of the slaves, uh, that Juneteenth was a way of letting the people know that finally they're free. Many of the celebrants understood the meaning behind the celebration. It means uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'm old enough to understand what it means. And uh, it's been, uh, well, it's bringing a lot of people together of black race and many other races here today show that, uh, well, we're all here together. So that's about it. And we're free. I see uh, a lot of the things that should be uh, brought out about the young black people enjoying themselves in the proper manner and without a lot of conflict. I also see that the uh, black race is coming together and raising their children as a community. It means freedom. We were set free as slaves and now we're free and we celebrate the free being set free. It's very important because we were held down and compressed for so long that now we're free to be who we are and free to learn education, free to be ourselves, free to own property, free to do whatever. Juneteenth started a summer of festivals for Milwaukee's African American communities. Our Bobby Drake has more. People have made general assumptions and confused the two festivals, yeah. both African World Festival and AfroFest. But if you had to make the difference absolutely clear, what would you say? For the last couple of years, uh, there had been no festival. Right. So it's time for us to step again. I, I feel so strongly that we need to be represented. We're the largest ethnic group you know, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the state, uh, you know, Afrocentric group. And, um, and we should be represented. And so I talked with people, was it Mike Brox? That, uh, that I, I put it out there, the community stepped up. All of our entertainers out here are volunteering. The vendors, everybody's volunteering. Nobody's getting paid anything. So, I mean, I'm just so proud of the community for stepping up and to believe that we should be represented. At AfroFest, traditional drumming, traditional dancing, traditional jewelry, and even the Civil War reenactors are all present to remind us of the culture. This is something that I want to hand over to the youth. I was 26 years old, I was 25 years ago, I was 26 years old when I started AfroFest. This is a young person's game. I would love to hand this over to young people, but we have to show them how to do it the correct way. These are people that's, that's already, already been through this, what, what we're going through. So it's, it's better just to come as, as, to come as one and be together. And, and it's, it's, it's young people that, that should be trying to do something with that. The AfroFest legacy I am not too familiar with, but as far as activities for the African American and the African community in Milwaukee, I think this is a very important an opportunity and event that is occurring here. And I hope that this being the first one, it'll continue for years to come and not be considered a rival to the African World Festival, but another option for citizens, um, residents of Milwaukee and the surroundings to, to attend. 
And with the return of African World Festival, we have to ask, why were they gone over the past two years? I mean, after a while, an organization uh, just needs to reorganize and um, determine which direction they're going to go in. So we had to reorganize and we had to realize that our forefathers left us a great charter to build on. So that's what we did. African World Festival has seen many changes over the years, but the young man involved in the shooting was also present this year. Um, as she explained, I did uh, put a bad name on African World Festival. Um, I did call and said um, my deepest concerns and sincerity of my apology to the African World Festival. I'm not perfect. But I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm helping myself out. And like I say, my backbone is, is what I'm living for right now. But I would like to definitely apologize to my community and also to the African World Festival of that incident. Thank you. To intergenerationally bring into the whole mix all kinds of generations so everyone can learn the template. Then we'll know that the festival will continue beyond my ability to be a part of it. So, Joe, what brings you down to African World hey, Festival this year, man? I'm ready to do my thing here, man. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah going what are you getting ready to do? Get ready to do Potawatomi stage at 3 o'clock, uh, me and Soul Trio. The return of African World Festival has many excited about the continuation of a long-standing tradition. Joe Jordan sums it up best. The great music, you know, coming from um, all kinds of music, and the great food, the great food and the spirits and and the art, you know, it's just so much going on, so much going on down here, you know. And I look forward to it every time. Over the summer, Dr. Gregory Thornton took over the leadership of the Milwaukee Public School System, and he joins us now. Dr. Thornton, welcome to Black Nouveau, sir. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Thornton, you come to MPS with 30 years of experience in a variety of systems. What are the major problems you see in MPS, and how do you propose fixing them? As I look at MPS, MPS is like many urban systems around America. We face some of the challenges that urban systems are encountering, and as a result of that, many of our young people are not getting quality education. So as we move forward, we're moving forward with, I think, with what I would probably guess is one of the most aggressive reforms in public education today with a strong focus around teaching and learning. And in that teaching and learning, under that teaching and learning umbrella, a focus around early childhood, getting our young people off to great starts, a focus around high schools, because each day youngsters leave high school either dropping out or being pushed out, a focus around not allowing low-achieving schools to be allowed to operate in school districts, a focus around getting our young people into colleges. And so when you bring all those challenges together, uh, we're positioned, uh, I think, to move MPS to a place, hopefully, that uh, will allow our young people to really do some great things as they join adulthood. Let's discuss a few of them in greater detail. Sure. Teaching and learning, how do you propose going about doing that much better? Well, a couple of things. One, as I begin to think about teaching and learning, as I think about it for Milwaukee, the number one focus for us is around helping our teachers deliver quality instruction in the classroom. Right now, in our classrooms, as you begin to look through the data, that we have significant numbers of young people not being successful. When you look at our African-American boys, African-American boys rate at the bottom mm -hmm. of America's schools. And as a result of that, it speaks very clearly to me as a call to action to say that we can no longer continue to, to support young people in that way. There's a gap that exists, and that gap has been in Milwaukee probably for the last 10 or 15 years. Can no longer accept that as, as a way of doing business here in, in, in the school district. You're so. fairly new. Yes. And oftentimes people coming into an area that's new see things that people who have been there for a while don't see. Why do you think that this achievement gap has occurred, as you stated, in the past 10 or 15 years in Milwaukee? 
Well, because I think people look at it and they think it's going to go away. But I'm here to tell you that I've been doing this for a long time. Nothing goes away without intervention, without making some hard decisions, without having the courage and the will to change what we're doing. Uh, presently, right now, we walked into Milwaukee Public Schools. We had probably different curricula mm -hmm. throughout the school district. We've been very successful in coming together with one comprehensive literacy program. Our youngsters, unfortunately, for whatever reason, no choice of theirs, move around. It's unfair for it's unfair to have our youngsters meet different types of expectations throughout the organization. We just passed a major textbook series that allows our youngsters to have the support that they need with really great text, great print. And, and you know, for, for the very first time, I think our youngsters are beginning to see themselves in the print and beginning to see that they, if they're invested, that they will have an opportunity certainly to benefit from these opportunities. Now, we will revisit the achievement gap sure. a little later in this process. You've been quoted as saying that one of the problems in urban schools is that the schools start things and don't see them through. How will you change that in MPS? Well, I think less is more. And for a very long time, one, if you were to talk to folks in Milwaukee, they would tell you they have random acts of greatness throughout the organization, and that's not good enough anymore. What I will be proposing is that what we do, we see it through, we sustain it. Two things I look for as a superintendent. One, can I take it to scale? That means everybody gets an opportunity to have access to good curricular access and opportunities to, to, to have the same things that are in all schools. And the other is, can we sustain it? And often we begin things not knowing what the end is going to be like. So I start things knowing that I have a, a, a way to actually sustain the, the process, to sustain the initiative as, as we move forward. And I think those things will position us well as we move forward. Okay. You've mentioned curriculum on more than one occasion. In what ways will you propose changing that curriculum to achieve some of the things that you mentioned? We've been a very decentralized school district, okay. meaning that everybody in the organization has had the flexibility to move and utilize curricula in the way they felt was necessary. Mm. We will standardize the curriculum. We will raise the bar on the curriculum, and we will basically provide that same curriculum to every youngster in the district. It's impossible for our young people to compete if they don't have access to the information. And, and as a result of that, that standardization, I think, will bring about a really good unified approach to delivering high quality instruction in, in, in classrooms. What role will accountability play in that? Accountability is everything. You know, it's a, I'm a very data-driven person. Performance uh, matrix matrices are very important to us. Uh, one of the things we will be courageous. I think we do have the will. We're we're courageous enough to close bad schools. We're courageous enough to have the the big conversations. We're courageous enough to have conversations with teachers and principals around the fact that we're not educating all kids. Those are critical issues. No longer in America can we not educate all children. And for me, as, as we begin to move forward, those, those issues will be paramount in the conversations that we have uh, to determine our ability mm -hmm. to continue to move this reform forward. You have invited the Milwaukee community to stand up for its student achievement, teacher quality, and the arts. What have you seen in MPS that caused you to do that? Well, I see a lot of people sitting down. I mean, folks stand up for a, a moment in time. And one of the challenges, districts like MPS, people get upset. You know, when the test scores come out, everyone's riled up, everyone's upset, but that upset lasts for a day or two. If you're going to be upset, you need to be upset continually, and you need to continue to be an advocate for your young people. No one's going to love your children. No one's going to hold your children's best interests other than you as parents. And I'm saying to the parent community, you got to get involved. you got to get engaged. And no longer is it acceptable to sit on the sideline. You know, it's easy to call a, a football game on Monday after the, after the game's played. I'm asking them to get in the game, get their uniform a little dirty, and let's work this thing together. And I think we can bring about a change for, for young people. Briefly, why do you think that the anger doesn't last long? Uh, in our next interview, we'll get into well, uh, the achievement yeah. gap things of that sort in, in, in about 30 seconds. Why do you think there's not more anger in Milwaukee, especially when you look at closing this achievement gap in which we would deal with next week? You become immune to it. It's been around for so long and we've accepted it as, as a practice, as, as a way of life. Uh, one of the things that I think folk are challenged with in Milwaukee, you know, Milwaukee's we have an issue around unemployment. We have some many personal issues that sometimes get in the way. But my message to everyone, there's nothing can get in the way of a child's education. We have a moral imperative in this city and around this country to educate all kids. Thank you so much, Dr. Thornton. Join, Join us again, again next week as we continue this conversation with Dr. Thornton. For many of us, there's no music like old school music doo-wop, mellow harmonies, and great love songs. Lynn Collins has more.
This is the Seven Sounds Band, along with members of the Soul Food Band, performing at Summerfest. In the 60s, bands were hot, and one of the hottest bands in Milwaukee was Harvey Scales and the Seven Sounds. A little history on the Seven Sounds. They started as a jazz band out of North Division High School and changed over to a rhythm and blues band. Over the years, like most bands, they parted ways. They now continue to come together to perform as they did for Summerfest. Of the surviving members, only two call Wisconsin home. What really brought the band attention was their leader, Harvey Scales. Sweet soul music. Scales and co-member Al Vance wrote a tune, originally meant for the band, but was recorded and performed by Johnny Taylor, entitled Disco Lady. This tune became a hit and was nominated for a Grammy. It's called Shake It Up, Shake It Down, Sexy Lady, originally. And um, well, when we got with Don Davis as a producer, you know, him being a real slick producer, he said, man, this is the disco era. And he changed that to Disco Lady. Because at that time, everything was disco, you know. Disco food, disco bread, everything was disco, you know. So he changed it to a uh, uh, Disco Lady, you know. And uh, which wasn't a bad thing, because I think that probably prompted it to be such a hit at the time, you know. And by the way, it was, we was blessed, because that was the first platinum single of 45 in history. The Seven Sounds was one of the first big horn funk bands making some noise back in the day in Milwaukee. Some of the other bands performing then were Elon Butler and the New Breed, uh, Latasha LaFont and the Exploits, uh, Symphonic Sounds, James Hands and the Entertainers, uh, Lil Artie and the Pharaohs, uh, and numerous other ones, you know up in Madison and all over during the cl uh, classics. Uh. section last night was phenomenal. Because oh, I know back yeah. in the day, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, seeing a real band, that's what you, people went to see bands back in the day. Yeah. During last night's performance, you made, you paid tribute to Otis Redding. Why? Um, because Otis Redding, like we were so many uh, young bands, we were their mentors. Otis Redding was our mentor. Uh, as a matter of fact, we used to open for Otis Redding and we opened for him here once in Milwaukee. And um, he was impressed and he got us signed with Stax Records uh, out of Memphis, Tennessee. And we went there and uh, recorded Broadway Freeze and I Want to Do It and uh, numerous other songs, you know, at Stax Records. And uh, today I'm still one of the Stax artists that's alive myself and Eddie Floyd, Mavis Staples, uh, Carlos Thomas, uh, um, William Bell and Jay Blackfoot from the Soul Children, we still go back and perform at Stax Music Academy, which Stax Music Academy trains, still trains young kids to play horns and keyboards and guitars and drums. And so they keep uh, the live music thing a lot alive and uh, alive in there. The band's first big hit was Get Down, and they recorded Glamour Girl and Love Itis. Harvey 
Scales Jr., a.k.a. Scales with a Z, continues the entertainment tradition. The fame of Disco Lady put Scales on the music map. These days, Harvey, who resides in Atlanta, makes his living writing music. I started writing for everybody. Uh, the OJs, uh, the Dramatics, uh, Marilyn McCool and Billy Davis, Millie Jackson, uh, Jay Giles Band, CL Smooth, Pete Rock, uh, all, you know, all different type of music, you know. So it's finally Biz Marquis and uh, Benny Siegel as of late. Just like it's cold outside in January. Harvey said his music career has been hard and great. His advice for those who want to get into the entertainment business, get a good entertainment lawyer. As a professor and student of history, I understand the importance of preserving our own stories and our own voices. Everett Marshburn has an update on the status of America's Black Holocaust Museum and how some treasures were almost lost forever. A word of caution, the opening images are not for the faint of heart. Black bodies swinging in the southern This 80-year-old photograph is one of the grimmest reminders of a very dark period in American history. The two young black men who had just been lynched were part of a trio accused of robbing, raping, and assaulting a white couple in Marion, Indiana. The third member, 16-year-old James Cameron, survived the mob, but he did do jail time. He later dedicated his life to civil rights causes and founded America's Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee in 1988. It was dedicated to preserving the history of lynching and chronicled the struggle of black people for equality in the United States. When Dr. Cameron died in 2006, the museum was not on a firm financial foundation. It closed two years later amid hopes that it would reopen with community and institutional support. I've been tremendously surprised by the amount of support that we've gotten since we made the announcement that we're closing temporarily. A lot of people from the community have reached out and offered to be volunteers, uh, have offered to help us in terms of grant writing, uh, building strategic plans, a variety of things like that. But that effort has not been successful. The building is vacant and the museum's artifacts are in storage. Perhaps its greatest treasures, Dr. Cameron's writings, letters, and personal collections, were almost destroyed. I got a telephone call from uh, a junk man who um, was trying to find some place or someone to purchase the material. And I understood the value of it, and so I called him back a couple weeks later, and uh, he said he still had it. Uh, it was in a rainy season, and uh, the stuff was so much, it was outside in plastic bags. And so um, he needed to find some place for it to go um, before it was totally destroyed. As it was, some of the material were, was water uh, damaged. Benson says he sorted through almost half of the 200 bags of materials that are now at the Wisconsin Black Historical Society and Museum. Oh man, I got a lot of his letters. I've got a lot of his writings. I got his editorial uh, articles that he wrote to the newspapers on various subjects. He was very opinionated about a, a wide range of subjects. Uh, I got his speeches. 
uh, I got his letters to uh, Senator Kennedy, his le letters to uh, Oprah Winfrey, and to anybody, to see the Indian Holocaust uh, struggles, uh, to Jane Doe. He got letters from all over the world, and I got them. A lot of material, a lot, uh, and a lot of material to read. That just going through. Uh, you know what's interesting? Uh, many of the books in the magazines, um, those that survived the water, um, really looks at uh, a thirty-year period: the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, some 80s. But you could really see his opinion and his feeling. I think his story is really important because it really, he is the last survivor of this uh, Holocaust or this period in which our people were terrorized through lynchings. And he was the one person that the United States Senate uh, apologized to. Benson says that the first exhibit of Dr. Cameron's materials will be available for viewing at the Black Historical Society in about six months. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night.